Um, I'm very happy to be here, very happy to be in Coimbra University, and above all, very happy to be here as part of the celebration of, uh, of the contribution of Bell Ventura. Science aims by means of empirically grounded investigation to obtain understanding of the objects, phenomena, events, and systems of the world, to develop theories which I understood, understand broadly in terms of systematic cognitive structures of various kinds, sometimes narratives, in which knowledge of the causal order in which they are enmeshed can be represented. It also aims to anticipate the possibilities occasioned by their interactions with one another and with human beings, and to discover how to bring about desired possibilities to realization. Modern scientific knowledge has aspired to be comprehensive, in principle able to encompass all objects and phenomena of the life world, and its pursuit and its cognitive products have been said to belong to the shared patrimony of humanity, available to be utilized even-handedly by interests connected with all value outlooks. Any methodological approach in science is characterized by the adoption of what I call a strategy. A strategy constrains the kinds of theories and claims that may be entertained by specifying the categories they can deploy and the types of objects and possibilities that can be investigated, and selects the types of empirical data obtained from observing those objects that are relevant for testing the theories and claims. Investing, uh, investigating different kinds of objects may require adopting different kinds of strategies. Strategies of molecular biology and biotechnology, for example, are adopted to investigate the genomes of plants and the possibilities for modifying them. But to investigate the effects of using transgenics on the human, social, and ecological dimensions of objects in the life world, one must adopt strategies that permit using social and ecological categories that have no place in theories developed in molecular biology and biotechnology. And in agroecology, still other kinds of strategies must be adopted in order to identify the possibilities of plants, qua components of sustainable agroecological systems, and qua socio-cultural socio objects that may have a role in practices that are integral to the aspiration for food sovereignty and strengthening the agency of local farmers. Moreover, an object of the life world may be of various kinds. Transgenics, for example, are technological objects. They are also biological objects that are part of agroecosystems that include inputs of agrotoxics and artificial fertilizers. And they are property of agribusiness corporations. Thus, in order to comprehend an object of the life world fully and to identify all the possibilities it affords, it would have to be investigated under a variety of strategies. That is to say, pursuing comprehensive understanding of objects of the life world requires what I call multi-strategic research. Choosing the objects to investigate in a particular research project, and therefore the strategies that should be adopted in it, often derives from value-laden or political economic interests. More generally, there are relations of mutual reinforcement between adopting the strategy and adhering to an ethical, social value outlook. In mainstream scientific institutions, research practices in which what are called decontextualizing strategies, or DSs, are adopted, tend to be considered exemplary. DSs constrain the theories and claims to be able to represent the generative powers of the underlying causal order of objects. That is to say, their underlying molecular structures, their processes and interactions, and those of their components and all the laws that govern them. 
without taking into account the possibilities that objects may afford in virtue of their places in human, social, and ecological contexts. Nevertheless, although relatively little attention has been paid to them in the philosophy of science, there are strategies that do enable the investigation of the possibilities of objects that are not encapsulated in the generative potential of their underlying order. I call them context-sensitive strategies, or CSs. The strategies adopted in molecular biological and biotechnological research that have given origin to transgenics are examples of DSs. Those of agroecological research include some CSs. They enable knowledge to be obtained of seeds and plants not only connected with their underlying order, but also with the agroecosystems in which the seeds are planted and their crops harvested. Research conducted under agroecological strategies treats the physical, chemical, and biological as interconnected with the social, human, cultural, and historical, and integrates knowledge obtained from research in modern scientific disciplines with knowledge generated by farmers in the course of their activities, including that derived from traditional and indigenous sub -areas. That makes it possible to obtain knowledge that can inform, for example, how well there can be achieved the desirable balance <coughs> in an agroecosystem of such variables as productivity, sustainability, maintenance of biodiversity, social health, and the strengthening of the agency, values, and cultures of all members of the community involved with the agroecosystem. There are relations of mutual reinforcement between adopting agroecological strategies and adhering to values of social justice, democratic participation, and environmental sustainability. Multi-strategic research allows roles for both DSs and CSs. DSs are indispensable for investigating the underlying order of objects and thus for obtaining comprehensive understanding of their causal powers. Appropriate CSs must, must also be adopted in order to obtain understanding of objects that are inseparable from their context of the life world and of the full range of their causes, possibilities, and effects of their interactions. However, research that requires adoption of CSs tends to receive relatively little attention in mainstream scientific institutions. These institutions and their funding bodies tend to prioritize DS research almost to the point of exclusivity. And programs of scientific education aim to introduce students virtually exclusively to the results and methods of DS science and to apprentice some of them to become practitioners of DS science. Prioritizing of DS science in this way reflects that widely held interpretations of modern science tend to endorse claims like the following. One, control, technological control, is the distinctively human stance to take towards nature. Two, it is by way of augmenting human powers to exercise control over natural objects and of embodying ever more deeply in the life world the values of technological progress that nowadays are inseparable from the values of capital and the market. The general equality of human lives can be bettered. Three, DS knowledge manifests exemplary cognitive credentials it has unsurpassed reliability and universal significance and applicability. Four, DS knowledge should be applied to inform practical activities in the life world. Or more strongly, it holds, in order to be rational, human action and practices should be informed by established DS knowledge and never by claims to contradict
Dia's knowledge is needed to identify possibilities for techno-scientific innovations. And more generally, there are mutually reinforcing relations between adopting Dia's and upholding values of technological progress and of capital and demand. Thus, where one and two are held, the general significance of DS research is uncontested. Items three and four then move beyond significance to virtual exclusivity. Together, the four claims nourish the current tendency for institutionalized science to become identified with commercially oriented technoscience. That is to say, with scientific research primarily aimed at generating techno-scientific innovations that serve interests that embody values of capital and the market. Section 2. The claims 1 to 4 are rejected by proponents of traditional and indigenous sub-areas and of agroecologists. To get at what is at stake, I will first offer a provisional characterization of the notion of sub-areas. A sub incorporates first a form of knowledge and a body of knowledge of that form. Second, ways of knowing, knowing how as well as knowing that, ways of coming to gain knowledge, the procedures and methodological approaches used for obtaining, evaluating and transmitting it, and ways in which knowledge is manifested in actions and modes of living, and embodied in the objects used in practices and ways in which they are used. It is fostered by the mode of life of a social or cultural group whose practices are informed by items of the knowledge and transmitted from generation to generation. Moreover, the knowledge concerns objects, phenomena, and systems of the life world, as experienced, identified, and interacted with by members of the group. Their properties, constituents, and relations with one another, their causes and origins, and the possibilities open to them when they interact. Fourth, the categories in which the knowledge is expressed may draw from the cosmovision or from the presuppositions of the value outlooks embodied in the lives and practices of the group, including practices of resistance and struggle, and so from their conceptions of nature, of human nature and human well-being, and of proper relations of human beings with one another and with nature. So that consequently, fifth, our sub is socially, culturally, and historically located. It is fostered in a specific situation, and the knowledge obtained is especially attuned to inform exemplary activities of that situation and to address problems that arise in it. No one sub can serve to comprehend all objects in the life world and to inform all practices in all situations. Traditional and indigenous sub may maintain, contrary to item one that I introduced before, that there exist stances towards nature, celebrated among certain groups and cultures, that cannot be reduced to control. I'm thinking of stances such as respect, love, admiration, mutual support and interdependence, maintenance, conservation, restoration, and adaptation. Contrary to two, human well-being depends on cultivating and adopting these stances. Contrary to three, some knowledge generated in traditional sub-areas, deriving from the experiences and practices in the life world, has reliably met the test of time thereby challenging the universal significance and applicability of DS knowledge. In contrary to four, acting informed by knowledge obtained under DSs is unable to take into account 
all of the human, social, and ecological consequences of so acting. And therefore, acting in that way is not informed by some knowledge that would be required to support its rationality. When the traditional sub areas reject the four claims, they do not thereby reject the cognitive credentials of results soundly established in DS research. What they reject is the general significance of these results. That is to say, their value for informing practices and ways of life. The four claims are best seen as presuppositions of prioritizing DS research to the virtual exclusion of CS research. They are certainly not established in DS research itself, and they cannot even be formulated using categories acceptable in DSs. That is because, unlike some CSs, DSs lack the conceptual and methodological resources needed to investigate adequately the effects of technological, economic, colonial practices to gain part of their legitimation from appeal to the four claims. I'm thinking of effects that include, such as the undermining of the lives and cultures of those whose ways of life are informed by the traditional sub areas. DS has also lacked the categories, the resources needed to identify possibilities that may be afforded by those ways of life and constructive interactions with them, including those informed by what Bill Ventura has called the epistemologies of the South. It is ironic if research is limited to adopting DSs, that the four claims cannot themselves be supported empirically and that, moreover, any empirical support they might be able to obtain would have to derive from investigations in which CSs are adopted that draw upon the traditional sub areas. Section three. Interpreting science in terms of multi-strategic research opens up new ways for thinking about the relationship of science and traditional sub areas. Here are two ways that might be further explored. A. Interpret the knowledge obtained in a traditional sub-air as if it were generated under a CS whose adoption bears mutually reinforcing relations with adherent to values embodied in the way of life and practices of the group that foster the sub-air. And B. Interpret multiple multi-strategic research to consist of a set of sub-areas, each one identified by a strategy that belongs to the larger set of socially, culturally, historically situated sub-areas that also contain traditional ones, of which all members in principle generate knowledge with comparable cognitive credentials. A takes science as the starting point, but where science is interpreted in terms of multi-strategic research, and so where scientific research is not identified with the predominant trends of mainstream scientific institutions that prioritize adopting DSs, and it proposes to incorporate traditional sub-areas into science, so understood. Whereas B begins with recognizing the value and sound cognitive credentials of traditional sub-areas and indicates that the scientific sub-areas share relevant cognitive credentials with them. A may help to bring modern science into closer accord with its proclaimed ideals of comprehensiveness and of being part of the shared patrimony of humanity. Whereas B brings to the forefront that all sub-areas are situated, a perspective from which the significance and autonomy of traditional sub-areas can be affirmed, as well as that of the cultural practices that foster them. It also motivates efforts to recover 
the subalities that had been pushed aside and rendered invisible in the name of the alleged cognitive superiority of modern science. In suggesting A, it is recognized that knowledge generated in many of the sub-areas is unequivocally sound, having been generated from the reflective exercise of the practical know-how of those whose activities foster the sub-areas. It has met the test of time. Notably, in such areas as selected seeds that are well adapted to available agroecosystems, in managing sustainable agroecosystems and forests, preserving biodiversity in them, and engaging in practices that deploy artifacts that are compatible with maintaining uh, sustainability. Medicinal plants and practices and the necessary conditions for the well-being of local communities. Regarding B, the idea that each strategy permitted in multi-strategic research identifies as sub fits easily with my fits easily with my early characterization of sub -air. Each strategy defines a form of knowledge and generates a body of knowledge of that form. It defines the methodological approaches for generating and testing such knowledge claims. It is fostered by particular practices and modes of living, which embody specific values, and is especially attuned to inform them. DS sub-areas, for example, are fostered by the dominant modes of life found in modern technological, industrial, capitalist societies whose practices are informed by items of DS knowledge and embody highly values of technological progress and of capital and the market. The traditional sub-areas are situated differently from DS sub-areas. Typically, each one is an integral part of social practices that foster the sub-area and that are informed by the knowledge generated in it. And the practices fostered by different sub-areas tend to be engaged in locales that are culturally distinct. In contrast, DS sub-areas are situated socially and historically within a trajectory that is shaped by interests that embody values of, cap of technological progress and of capital and the market. This is a trajectory towards cognitive uniformity that has led to the weakening of traditional sub-areas, one shaped by various colonialist forces, currently mainly a neoliberal form, including cognitive ones, which, nourished by the claims one to four introduced earlier, consider that it signifies human progress to replace the situations that foster traditional sub-areas with modern ones. The, colonial, the, the cognitive colonialist forces have stood by and often enough actively participated while traditional sub areas have been subjected to violence in the name of the superior and universal cognitive credentials of DS knowledge. In the face of, in the face of ongoing colonialist threats that are strengthened by their alliance with commercially oriented techno-science, it is important to organize for resistance to the threats, and hence to cultivate and defend the independent spaces in which traditional sub-areas can be maintained and developed, and the, and the ways of life in them support and strengthen. The traditional sub-areas may be developed in ways that support this resistance and open up new possibilities. Doing so would strengthen the values of the traditional groups so that they could be richly embodied in the world being shaped and also contribute to resolving the great crises of the contemporary world, the environmental, climate, and social crises of the contemporary world. If I understand Bella Ventura correctly, 
Such developments are integral parts of programs of the epistemologies of the South. I think that my item B provides a perspective that can facilitate dialogue between them and various modern uh, scientific currents in a way that recognizes the autonomy and indispensability of the epistemologies and at the same time points to a better way of engaging in modern science. It certainly brings to the fore that sound cognitive credentials derive from having proper relations with the appropriate kinds of experience. They do not derive from the strategy that is adopted in research. When science is understood in terms of multi-strategic research, the grounds often appeal to for the dismissing traditional sub-areas lose any rational credibility they might otherwise appear to have. Finally, section four. I imagine a future in which science is enacted by a much broader cast, with a great variety of actors, producers, and directors, and for a, a variety of different audiences, increasingly for people in struggle. In that science, there would be no scientific, empirical, or cognitive barriers to exploring questions like the following. How should scientific research be conducted? <clears throat> in order to obtain knowledge that could inform practices and innovations for use in them that would strengthen the rights, values, and well-being of everyone everywhere, and that could illuminate the conditions needed for the effective participation of everyone in a democratic society and for interacting with nature in ways that respect it, by attempting to ensure that nature's regenerative powers are not further undermined and restore wherever possible. And then, in the light of A, by whom should this research be conducted? Under the auspices and direction of whom? Adopting what strategies and variety of strategies? And in the context of what kinds of social, institutional, and cultural organization? And taking B into account, with what variations deriving from different situations, including what situations, with what priorities, incorporating what roles the traditional indigenous knowledge and for knowledge born of the struggle for recognition and emancipation of those suffering from colonialist and related forms of violence. How can it interact with and contribute towards strengthening the knowledge born of struggle? To conclude, imagining the future is important, but it's not the end, it's a step. Further questions emerge, with whom to organize, and how to work towards creating the conditions and confronting the obstacles, or the conditions in which, which will need to be established for science for scientific institutions and organizations to be able to be responsive to these questions. That, to me, is the most urgent, practical question uh, concerning conducting science today. Thank you. <laughs>